Okay, guys. <clears throat> Today I'm going to be, or right now I'm going to be talking about uh, We Happy Few, the video game. Um, I recorded a review earlier. It turned out to be about an hour, actually longer than that. It turned out to be close to like an hour and 40 minutes, something crazy like that. Um, I wanted to try and re-record some audio for this, not only because um, it's obviously too long-winded, but because uh, I know how ironic this is. I feel like the game already sucked uh, too many hours away from me as it is. So here I am devoting more time to it. But um, I think it'll be better in the long run because I won't be editing such a long video for, you know, and, and each clip I have is only an hour long. So, you know, it's having to import multiple clips and select the stuff you want and cut that out and put it in, you know, all of that takes just forever. And when I was you know, piecing together the audio that I recorded and realizing that it got very rambly and realizing all the work I was going to have to do to not only fix the audio but put in proper video, I came to a realization. Like, I just don't care enough. I don't care enough about this game to really, you know, give it that kind of time. I just posted a review for Thief 2X The Metal Age. Uh, be sure to check that out. I mean, not just the review but the game itself because... That was a phenomenal experience, and I was so excited about what that game offered and and the experience that I had that I had no problem not only talking about it at length, but also, um, you know, taking the extra time to really edit a proper review for it and uh, do it right. So, um, in working on that review, because I wanted to put this one out first, but in working on that review, I realized... I just don't like this game. And, you know, in the other review, I talked about... I went into depth about all the gameplay and the details and what you can expect and the plot and, you know, these little things that I liked and, you know, really trying to give every possible... Uh, uh, noteworthy occurrence in the game the respect that I felt it in the moment that it deserved um, but in reflection yeah I just uh, it's a very very boring game and it's extremely long and tedious um, so We Happy Few is a game where you play as this guy called Arthur Hastings uh, you live in this uh, British dystopian world, very kind of Orwellian, 1984 meets uh, Brave New World, um, with some Monty Python thrown in, and just some general nods to British culture, uh, you know, during the war and post-war as well. Um, and uh, everybody takes this drug called Joy, and what Joy does is uh, makes everything look beautiful and wonderful and gives you a sense of euphoria and I wouldn't even call it a side effect I think it's an intended um, part of what the drug does to you you also forget you forget anything bad anything at all actually um, and so everybody in the society is forced to take this drug and if you don't you are ostracized from this society and forced to live out in the wilderness and um, Basically, the reason that the society came about is it's a it's an alternate uh, history of World War II in Britain. Um, the German blitz on Britain was successful, and they invaded and uh, occupied Britain for quite some time. Um, what I found interesting was usually when people do post or alternate history versions of World War II, the Nazis win. And what I found very Ooh, crap, is that going to be, uh, is that going to get flagged because I said that word? The Germans win. I'll, I'll see if I can edit that out. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, the Germans usually win in alternate, and it, it's exploration of what would happen if the Germans won. Well, they just won this part of the war. They didn't win the entire war. And what I found sort of interesting about the story was, yeah, uh, the Germans are still defeated, but it's just about the the fallout um, and the impact that the occupation had on this uh, British town. Uh, it's kind of unbelievable because it's made very clear that this is like one of the only places in Britain that's like this. 
uh, they don't really know what's happening in the rest of Britain. That's why I thought maybe the Germans won, because I thought maybe there was a nuclear war and everybody died, and this was one of the last surviving British cities, but it's not. They just choose to live this way. And much like in Bioshock, you know, the inventions and grand ideas of a few people helped to shape this entire society um, that is centered around this drug. They also have high-tech robotics and all this retro-futuristic 60s technology that some of it is futuristic for the 60s and some of it's futuristic for even modern day. It's stuff we don't necessarily have yet. Um, so, um, the whole idea of the game... Well, let me finish talking about the plot. So, yeah, so the Germans occupied and horrific things happened. And the reason this society came about was the convenient simultaneous development of joy and some other fantastic technologies and the fact that there was a... ...society-wide occurrence of something horrific that everyone wanted to forget. So something terrible happened that everyone was involved with and people did not behave how they expected they would behave or that they hoped they would behave and they couldn't live with themselves and so they created the society where you just take drugs to forget all your problems and you um, put on a happy face literally by wearing these white masks. The uh, imagery is not very subtle in this game and the themes are not very subtle and you take this pill to help you forget everything and to feel happy all the time. Um, so Arthur seems to have a flashback one day in the office and decides, it's up to the player, but I never uh, made the choice not to, decides not to take his drug. Um, you're labeled as a downer if this occurs, and uh, he's chased out of not only his office, but basically out of the city um, by the police and everybody. So the point of the game, especially if you, if any of you recall some of the early E3 trailers, all of it was centered around this sort of social stealth element. And kind of like Hitman, except more of in a survival horror sense. So instead of trying to get to your target to kill them, you're trying to get to your objective to either complete it or get away from everybody. And you can easily be found out, and you have to keep up appearances, you have to keep your mask on, you have to keep taking the joy, because people can detect when you're not on your joy so um, that's how it was marketed and another thing that I felt it was marketed as was sort of a indie game and indie games are typically you know low price not full sixty dollars they're also um, fairly quick to complete so I thought this was gonna be more of a sort of survival horror um, you know indie game in the vein of like um, Outlast or, or something like that where you just the whole objective is just to kind of escape and you have a couple of tools and you use some sh social stealth to try and get through this crazed creepy um, overly happy and zealous town where where you know it's all a facade it's clear that it's all a facade and there's a lot of hostility and there's a lot of um, um, control and there's uh, a lot of danger but it's, you know, put under the guise of this, you know, happy-go-lucky, you know, kind of the idyllic uh, 60s British town. Um, and so I was really, really intrigued by the E3 trailer, but the game that actually was delivered is just a mess. The whole thing is a mess. Um, basically, they made a, a kitchen sink game of gaming buzzwords that people think. So indie, that's a big one. Um... Uh, retro futuristic, uh, Bioshock esque, uh, procedurally generated, survival, stealth. You know, just take take a popular buzzword for indie games or gaming in general, and just put it in. And this game tried to do it. And the problem with that is that there's all these systems that you have to worry about in the game. You've got your social stealth system. You have your survival system. You have your um, uh, stealth and combat systems, you have the procedural generation of the environment, you have all this stuff to, to contend with, and it just becomes a mess, you know. What it was clearly inspired by is games like, um, 
you know, early looking glass games like uh, Thief and System Shock, and which of course inspired Bioshock. It's the most heavily influenced by Bioshock. It's it's the dystopian um, sort of immersive sim, and this is sort of it really wants to be an immersive sim. Um, the stealth is there, the combat is there, the modding out your character, they're selecting your sort of class. All of these things are there that are in immersive sims. Um, the notion that you need to craft different tools or or find different routes to get around certain problems. The problem is uh, that except for out in the open environment of the outside of the town basically, and except for just digging around and exploring, these immersive sim elements play no part in the game. Um, essentially, um, at least in System Shock or uh, Bioshock or uh, Thief or any of the classic, classic immersive sims, Deus Ex, uh, getting to your objectives is really all about um, player choice. Now, once you get there, you have to complete them the same way every time. But it's about how you get there and everything. But I just remember most of the story missions in We Happy Few being just completely linear affairs. Um, yeah, there's. I remember one where there's this like sentry tank going up and down this hallway. And I guess you could choose to fight it. But since there's only melee combat, you're probably not going to want to. And so you just have to do it the same way every time. And there's not multiple paths to uh, in and out of each room, you know, depending on your play style or depending on what abilities you have or what tools you have, it's just one long hallway and you have to do it the same every time. And most of the game is like that. There's not tons of ways to do everything. It's always just going to be the same thing. Um, the main gameplay breaks down between two basic builds. You're either a, a, a fisticuffs kind of a melee combat fighter or you are a, uh, a stealthy guy. And the problem with the game is the stealth system is so terribly implemented um there's just no point i mean i really don't understand you know when i was growing up uh, i got really heavily into stealth games and the first real stealth game i played was probably thief 2 or the dark project but i didn't really get it because i got it on one of those eidos demos discs so I mean, I played the hell out of it because I just thought it was such an interesting world, but I always sucked at it. So the first true stealth game I played that I was actually starting to get good at and, and understood the rules, and then I went back and played Thief afterwards, was uh, Splinter Cell. And in Splinter Cell, uh, line of sight is not king. You know, if you are concealed in the dark, if you're behind something, if, uh, if there's smoke in the way... Um, people won't see you and they won't see you immediately but I don't understand why a game like this with such an emphasis on the stealth aspect of the game would have a system where basically this is how I constantly felt if, if someone could turn and face me no matter how far away I was no matter how you know uh, if I was crouched no matter how dark it was no matter what kind of clothing I was wearing if someone could turn around and face me they'd see me and they'd start running after you like crazy um, and so the only real stealth in the game, like the only real safe place to hide in the game are garbage cans and when you're out in the meadows there's these uh, wildflowers that grow in these big uh, patches and you can hide in there. Um, that's not stealth to me. You know, that's just, that's just a, a half-assed stealth system to, make, to tell people, oh, we have a stealth system. But it, to me, there's no... There's too many opportunities for... for failure states and not enough opportunities to avoid failure states, you know? So unless you are absolutely the most patient person in the world and time everybody's movements and go around every house to make sure that no one ever faces you and everyone always has their back to you. I mean, I, I went through a room and I was trying to be very careful and I was knocking every single person out. One dude on the opposite end of the freaking room turned around and within two seconds he was on my ass hitting me with a cricket bat. You know, and that was like 20, 30 minutes of work. And uh, there was no way for me to go back into cover and hide from him, you know. Uh, when you're running from people in the city or out in the meadows, it's a little bit different. Yeah, you can you can sort of lose your pursuers, but because there's a stamina 
meter, uh, it, it's kind of really tough because every time you turn a corner, there's a new person there. And if they see you being pursued by everybody, and especially if you're not on your joy, they're going to start running after you too. So sometimes it's kind of hard to shake the cops or shake people. Um, you do get a uh, perk later in the game that allows you to run in the city without drawing suspicion. Um, and you can improve your stamina and stuff like that. So if you mix and match some abilities and, and some things in the game, some drugs in the game, you can sort of easily lose your pursuers. But just in a level, I don't know. This, the stealth was not fun and it was not doable. Um, it was really just a waste of time, you know, nine times out of ten, you know, and I love stealth games, you know, and I've played some really hard ones, you know. Uh, Thief 2 is not an easy game, and I played on the highest difficulty. Uh, Splinter Cell Chaos Theory, Splinter Cell Pandora Tomorrow, those are not easy games, and I've played on the highest difficulty, and I had a lot of fun, because it's, I feel that it's, it's fair. But this is just uh, poorly executed. So, um... Nine times out of ten, what will happen is if you get discovered, just pull out your strongest weapon and just go to town, you know. And all the survival aspects of the game, uh, they just drag the game out. And if that's one takeaway I have from the game, it's just everything is drawn out. Missions aren't designed to be fun. They're, at, they're designed to add time to the playthrough. You meet this inventor lady and you want her to make something for you. And you have to take this uh, buzzsaw thing to the hoods of cars and it will attract all these zombies in the middle of the night. And uh, you have to do this like four or five times. Oh dear. And the thing that sucks is y you travel all the way out of the city to her place. She immediately just tells you to go back out another ten miles or whatever to find all these cars. You come back and instead of telling you before you left, oh I also need these, she says, oh I'm going to send you back out to get five more things. And the whole game is like that. It's just constant fetch quests and constantly wasting your time. I mean, you, you, I can't tell you how many times you run from one end of the city back and then you, and, and back and you, you talk to the person you need to talk to and they send you right back to the same place um, again and again and again. And so it's just running back and forth everywhere. It is just a complete waste of time, most of the missions. And they're not fun. And because you're constantly having to stress out about these meters all the time. I understand that they were trying to produce, like, um, a feeling of paranoia, a feeling of anxiety. I need to keep myself fed. I need to be well-rested. I can't overdose on joy. Yeah, there's an overdose mechanic, so you can't just take the drug all the time and be fine. If you take too much, you'll throw it all up and then be discovered. So all of these things, but they're just nuisances. Um, and because none of the gameplay is engaging, I mean, the combat's actually pretty well implemented. It's not necessarily fun, but it's doable. I mean, melee combat's kind of hard to do in games. It usually just feels like you're um, uh, button mashing to get all your enemies. This game gives you uh, enough advantages to be able to properly block your enemies, deflect attacks, uh, deal you know a fair amount of damage. Um, so. Of, of all the systems in the game, yeah, the melee system works pretty well, and it kind of needs to, because it's really the only system that you can rely on to get through the game. Um, and once I got the perk to be able to run in public and stuff, I just stopped caring about exploring for, uh, you know, crafting items and, and exploring for loot. I just ran from one objective to the other to get through the story. So you have a gameplay with... Uh, boring, tedious, repetitive gameplay, and then on top of that, they make it a 40-hour game. And because of the procedural generation, um, none of the areas that are procedurally generated, some of them are very unfair. There's lots of places in the city where you won't have a joy dispenser. You won't be able to make it from one joy dispenser to the other without running out of joy, even if you double or triple dose. And so the only way to safely get through the city is to stock up on um, individual pills. But those are kind of hard to find. You'll find them a lot in some of the campaign missions, but you're not going to find them out in the world just lying around because the developers thought, oh, there's these dispensers. You don't need them. So, again, I see that they were trying to add tension, but it, again, it just becomes a nuisance and annoying, and it makes some parts of the game, you know, the difficulty doesn't come from the gameplay. The gameplay is pretty easy. The difficulty comes from the fact that it's so poorly designed because it wasn't designed it was just randomly thrown together by a computer there wasn't a game designer saying okay you know this this is a 
a fair distance to give some challenge between dispensers on the road or this is where I want this building that you can use as a hideout. Nothing like that. It's just randomly thrown together. Um, the stupid thing about the procedural generation is um, the idea is that because joy fucks with your memory, um, you can't rely on your memory. You know, you yourself are an unreliable narrator. And so um, I think the idea is that you go back out into the world and it's different every time. And you're like, whoa, this is trippy. This is crazy. The only problem is it doesn't work like that. It's not like every time you leave the city to go to the wilderness, the wilderness is different. And every time you come back into the city from being in the wilderness, the city is different. No, it's the same throughout the entire playthrough. And I, there are three playable characters, all with about a 15-hour story. That's a lot of time. But just imagine, it's the same map. Even if they changed it for each player, it would make more sense. Because you could say, oh, no one can really agree on what's going on in the world and what things look like uh but no it's the same map for all three players uh the procedural generation comes when you start a brand new game so you can beat the game with all three playable characters nothing will change the only time it'll change is if you start over and yeah that might be some sort of selling point point for replayability because if you start it again you won't know where all the good stuff is but the world is so huge and just randomly thrown together in, in a nonsensical way anyways, that it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter that it's procedurally generated. In fact, it's a, it's a disservice to the game itself because, you know, you can explore for hours out in the world and not find anything of real use. Um, you can be too far from resources all the time just trying to explore and gather more resources. So it's just, everything just seems like a waste of time in the game, you know? Um... And, yeah, I, I have to say that, too. So, as I got to the end of Arthur's campaign, I was nearing maybe the 20-hour mark because I did do a lot of side-questing in the middle to see if it went anywhere, and it doesn't. There's really no point in side-questing. There, there are some, like, interesting things, but, uh, you know, it's not worth the diversion. You know, I'd rather play, like, a Elder Scrolls-style RPG for the same type of, like, kooky quests or whatever rather than... Um, go through all the hassle in this game and all the resource costs to get the same. I mean, because the gameplay is not as fun. At least in the Elder Scrolls game, when you go on a side quest, like the gameplay is fun, the side quests are fun. You know, even this, even if the plot of a side quest in this game is mildly interesting, it's not worth the time taken to go actually complete it. Um, so, uh, Yeah, the, the, as I was nearing the end of his campaign, I was hit, I was getting close to the 20 hour mark between 15 and 20 hours and I was thinking like, all right, that's a pretty healthy sized game. I'm ready for this to be done. Let's see where the, the plot culminates. Let's see. But then I started a brand new playable character and her quest or her campaign was another 15 or 20 hours. And then I started a third playable character and I was just... Uh, you know, and, and again, since the map doesn't change, you kind of know where everything is, and, you know, it's just it's just a huge waste of time. And um, the third playable character, I almost reached a point where I couldn't continue the game because he's allergic to joy, and there's too many people on the streets of the city, and you get discovered too quickly to have any other means of getting through the city other than just running your ass off and trying to fight the police, which the game's not really designed for you to be able to do that. So... That was just a, a horribly done quest. I just had to run from point A to point B constantly. Um, I think you can get a perk where he's not as allergic to joy, and so you can actually start taking it. Um, but his system flushes it so fast that it, it's not that much of a help. Um, so, yeah. Uh, you know, I had this really long, drawn-out review before, and I really talked in depth. I mean, you don't really need to know that much about the gameplay. Um... If you've played a survival sim, it's the same thing. You try and find food and water, and your limit your inventory space is limited. Um, it's got social stealth, kind of like Hitman, but it's not really well implemented. It's it's a nuisance. It's not like a, it doesn't feel like a mechanic. It's a nuisance. Like for example, if you go outside the city, you have to wear tattered clothes, or the residents outside the city will get mad at you and try and kill you. But you can change right in front of them, and no one cares. 
you know, whereas in Hitman, you have to be concealed. Like, if people see you changing clothes, you know, and that's a big problem. And, um, yeah, once you get a couple of perks, uh, all the social stealth in the city doesn't matter. You can even get a perk where the police don't give a shit about you, basically. And so, yeah, it just goes all away. There's no point to any of it, and it was just it was it was poorly implemented and not fun or interesting to begin with. So, um, and there's lots of bugs in the game. Um, I I had some praises for the game for things like you know it has a really good mantling system because you don't see that a lot. You know, like the the original Thief and a lot of Looking Glass games, they had this uh, mantling mechanic which I like in games. I like when you you're a first person character. You know, like Gordon Freeman. You know, people say he controls like a fridge. And it's true. It's like he has no arms or anything. You know, if it's not, if he hasn't cleared the gap with his feet, he's not going to land on the other side. Whereas a human being would be able to grab the ledge and pull themselves up. So having a mantling mechanic in your acrobatics is fine. It's just that they don't do anything with it. There's a couple of rooms in the game where you can kind of get into the ceiling and get in the vents and find some loot or maybe circumvent one or two problems. But again, you know, they really wanted to be an immersive sim, I think. They were really play paying homage to Bioshock. Uh, definitely for sure because the first door code in the game is 0451 which is that's the whole, that's one of the calling cards of an immersive sim um, you know every item you see is highlightable and you know that's very much like like thief or bioshock or, or system shock you know it so they were really inspired by these games but they didn't do it justice because yeah, well, they try and provide some alternate paths here or there. Ultimately, it's just a giant linear thing. And the other thing about the city is, of Wellington Wells, you know, an immersive sim, like Deus Ex Mankind Divided, or, or Thief, uh, almost all of the buildings around you are explorable, and there's stuff in them. And, you know, you can use them to navigate the city in different ways if you need to avoid, you know, like, uh, checkpoints in the street or, or what have you. In this game... You would expect they would do something like that, but because it's procedurally generated, uh, virtually 90% of all the buildings have to be just uninhabited window dressing. And basically, they're just columns that line the streets to prevent you from... And there's no alleys either. There's a few alleys that kind of go behind a building, but they don't, connect to, they don't connect to alleys one to the other, so you can get off the streets and maybe not be seen and take the alleys instead to sneak past people if you're out of joy. No, the alleys just go to dumpsters. And if you go to a dumpster, your joy's going to run out and you sit in the dumpster. And then what are you going to do? The minute you go back out on the street, you're going to be discovered. So you can't really sneak around and, and the alleys serve no purpose. Um, and yeah, so it's the the... The buildings, let's call them, in We Happy Few are just walls. They're just giant walls around the streets to prevent you from <laughs> going over them or going between them. And there's nothing in them. There's a couple of houses in the entire city that you can like, break into and steal a shit. They never have good shit. It's too easy to be caught. And if you're caught, you're fucked. I mean, every cop in a 10-mile radius is going to be on your ass. So, yeah, this game was not fun at all. And it was just infuriating. And the only reason I pushed myself through it is I had so much footage recorded. And I said, well, you know, maybe it'll be worth putting up on YouTube. And maybe if I do a review, it'll be worth putting up on YouTube. But I definitely hit a point where I just didn't care anymore. Except for one thing. One thing that's phenomenal in the game that is really, really good is the story. Uh... All of the characters are very interesting. The effects that Joy has had on them are very interesting. Um, the characters are nuanced. Like, uh, one thing I really liked was you meet one of the playable characters in one of your quest lines as Arthur. And you have some presuppositions about her. And she acts in a way that seems very aloof um, or stupid or out of touch with reality. But when you play her campaign, you realize that she was hiding something from Arthur. And that's why she was making these weird requests and weird demands and stuff. Um, and I loved that. I loved that, you know, because I was thinking the same thing Arthur was. You know, I was just like, what are you, you're, you're asking me to risk my life for what? Like a $10, I don't want to spoil too much, but you're like, like a, something you used to be able, before the way you could get for $10 and it's not, it's not even worth that much now. It's just rare. Like, what are you talking about? It's not even like a, 
necessity. But then when you play her character, you understand that she's not just doing it because she she seems like she's manipulating Arthur the entire time, and and just uh, trying to push the envelope and trying to have him bend over backwards just because she likes toying with him. She's portrayed as sort of this like sociopathic person but then when you play her campaign you totally understand all her motivations and you side with her now another thing i really liked is you will have conversations with the other playable character and then when you get back to that point in the other person's campaign uh the situation will play out differently again highlighting joy's effects on people uh, one of the other things I liked is that e each person likes to remember the exchange as if they're the good guy. Like, especially if it's a negative exchange. They will remember what happened as if they did nothing wrong and they're the good guy. And I think that's, you know, I really liked that. That was sort of a nice little artistic touch because that goes beyond, you know, the effects of joy. I mean, that's that's just a part of the human condition that, you know, we have selective memory and we, we do um, fool ourselves. Uh quite often when when confronting things that we've done or confronting things about our past that we're uncomfortable with and we like to view ourselves as the good guy um, and that's kind of the point of most every character's campaign is that they they believe that things happen one way but as the drug wears off they realize that they're not the heroes they may have thought themselves to be you know or things that they held to be absolute truths about, you know, what they thought about other people or or their interactions with other people uh, are absolutely not the way that they perceived them to be because we do a lot of self-deception in order to still feel like, you know, we're righteous or we're the good guy. And I really liked that um, because that I thought that was an interesting message and, and pertinent and relatable. Um... So the other reason I finished the game was I just wanted to see where all of this went with all these characters and, you know, the culmination of the story and, you know, the final reveal of the plot. And all of that was beautifully done and it was really, really great. I, I loved the game for that and, you know, I thought the story was fantastic. Really, really fantastic and almost, no, not almost. If it was a 20-hour game, it would have been worth it just for the story. But 40 hours... Oh my god, dude. By the end, I was, like, pulling my hair out. I just couldn't stand it anymore. I just couldn't stand playing this dumb game that's just not fun, and it's it just... Half the mechanics in the game, like, they have these thing called uh, big nannies or big sisters or something like that. That are supposed to, like, if you don't take their joy, it's this giant menacing robot that will bend down and, like, beat the shit out of you, right? I didn't even know they were in the game until, like, the last part of the game, and I was so hopped up on joy all the time that it, I... It wasn't an issue. And I was like, w how could I not know this was like a big... Because then I went back and I watched some trailer footage. And they're all in the trailers and stuff. And it's supposed to be kind of like a selling point or, or selling, you know, an interesting bad guy. It's like, oh, play this game so you can check out this uh, enemy. I didn't even know they were in the game until almost before beating it. So, uh... Yeah, I I think this game would have been... They didn't know what it wanted to be. Um, and even if they did, uh, maybe they got greedy and wanted to push in a bunch of buzzwords and push in a bunch of uh, popular gameplay styles to try and attract a wider audience or something. Because if they had taken out some of the survival... I mean, if it had just been based on like social stealth and just stealth in the city only maybe some light melee combat to get out of sticky situations. That would have been fine, but the survival elements and the, proce the huge procedurally generated world that's, you know, with objectives all over it that you have to, like, traverse back and forth a million times, um, just wasting hours and hours and hours. Uh, the campaign missions that are just uninteresting and go nowhere except for the plot beats. Um, the linearity of it, even though it was trying to be, like, an immersive sim, I think it... What I thought it was going to be, yeah, it was a much more sort of linear indie experience or open world, but like a small open world, you know, like the town is only so big and, you know, like Deus Ex uh, Mankind Divided, you know, that uh, even smaller than that, you know, that that Czech city is not huge. You can walk from one end to the other in, I don't know, 10 minutes or so, but um, there's just 
you know, tons of places to hide, tons of stories going on, you know, breaking into people's apartments, finding them murdered, you know, figuring out what happened, finding their their drug stash or whatever, you know, finding the drug dealer, killing them, you know, stuff like that. I, I thought it was going to be more like that if they were going to do open world, or I thought it was going to be more like Outlast, where it's a really well put together um, sort of linear experience with lots of thrills and lots of chases and lots of, you know, social stealth to try and blend in. Uh, and I think it would have been better if they'd done that. You know, like a six to ten hour game that sort of told the same story. Because to be honest, most of the story beats don't take up more than a few hours of the campaign. The campaign is just running around, just fucking about doing nothing and just wasting time running from one end of this giant map to the other. It takes like 40 minutes every time, even with the fast travel system. So... Uh, yeah, and, and the survival elements just weighed everything down too because you're constantly having to stop, drop everything, find some food, find some water. Even if you stock up on the stuff, you know, um, you still got to sleep, you still got to get joy, you still got to heal and shit like that. Your weapons break down, so you got to find new crafting materials for your weapons. Like, all this shit, it's just a constant nuisance from this game. So, yeah, that's um, my review of... We Happy Few, it was just a... I'm actually sort of upset that I actually played it because I thought it was a big waste of time. Even though the story was phenomenal, I was really upset that it took that long to get through. And even the payoff of the story, like I said, it's just not worth the just outrageous length to the game. It drags on forever, and it's not interesting. You know, It's not clear what they were really gonna, trying to go for or what the core gameplay elements are. And if the core gameplay elements were implemented the way that the developers wanted them to be, then they're just bad developers. They made a bad, boring game. You know, there's... Survival games can be fun because it's about progression and it's about... Or it's about uh, immersion. You know, like, the long dark is not necessarily about becoming, like, an unstoppable... You know, building an unstoppable Iron Man suit or, or mech warrior towards the end because you've gathered so many resources and leveled up your science skill. No, it's, it's about the immersive experience of actually being lost in the woods and so then it's not a nuisance because you kind of get into that player's head but with all the kookiness and quirky sort of black humor in this game and um the objectives and the open world the objectives that send you back and forth constantly and the uh um the fact that it's very story driven um and narrative driven it just the survival elements didn't make sense they just took away from the experience and they were just distracting and a nuisance so, um, yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't recommend the game on any sort of sale or anything like that. Um, does it qualify as an immersive sim? I think much more than other games. Because somebody asked me that. Somebody on my channel asked me. Uh, much more than a lot of other games. You know, it really does try to make sort of an immersive world. And they do have things like notes laying around and old newspapers and stuff like that. So there is some world building. And you're not going to get the full story unless you do read some of these things that you find lying around. Um, they do give, make an effort to let you build a play style that works for you. They do make an effort to make things, give you unique solutions to problems as long as you're creative in your experiment. Um, but it doesn't always work out, you know. Uh, and, and one thing that immersive sh an immersive sim should do is that through your experimentation, you should find more effective means of dealing with your enemies. But in this game, even your experiment, you're like, wow, I didn't know I could pull that off. But still hitting him over the head with a, a bat with the spikes on the end of it is way faster than whatever the hell else I did. So, so screw awesome. it. I'll just do that. Um, oh, and I guess you can go through the game completely non-lethal if you want to, but there's absolutely no point because it has no bearing on the story whatsoever. <laughs> um, so that's a big waste of time kill everyone you need to i mean not everyone but everyone you need to just kill them all if you play the game but don't play the game um yeah oh and i was gonna say too yeah one of the one of the players is a chemist you know so the idea that they had for her playthrough is that you instead of relying on stealth or or brute force like some of the other characters you craft all sorts of like sleeping gas bombs and flashbangs and stuff like that but the 
by that point in the game, you are just so tired of the tedious survival gameplay. Oh, and they add a, they add a gameplay mechanic to her character that forces you to run back as fast as possible to your house constantly. You could be in the middle of the mission, the little indicator will pop up, and you gotta run the fuck back. And you add that on top of the survival stuff, I'm not gonna spend time searching for resources, and even when I did, I never found enough to actually craft even a single one of her stupid bombs. And at that point, I was not about to say, okay, I'm really gonna go side questing. You know, you're so tied down with that character because of her responsibilities at her apartment that there's no way. So you just end up bludgeoning everyone to death with, uh, she has better social stealth, she blends in better than anyone else, so you can also just get those perks and then just not have to get into combat at all, but, uh, yeah, you're better off just hitting people, even though you're shit at it, your character's shit at it, it's still easier than every other option, so just get the biggest melee weapon you can find and just use that, um, so that was all, yeah, that was all frustrating, all of those things, and so... Yeah, I just really did not like the game. And it's a shame because it's a game I was excited for. Um, and I think there's a lot of good ideas there for sure. I mean, I was instantly taken in. The art direction is amazing. The story is, is amazing. The setting is amazing. Some of the ideas in the game are, are amazing. Some of the messages. So there was definitely some thought put behind the narrative and the world and world building. But there was no either thought or competency put into the gameplay itself. And so, and even that could have been salvaged. The, the game could have the same gameplay and have been salvaged if it was just shorter. If it was 15 to 20 hours, I wouldn't have complained uh, as much. I'd probably have a lot more nice things to say. But 40 fucking hours. You know, there's so many other games I'd rather play 40 hours of my time. In fact, I've been trying to play the Ultima Underworld series because I got into uh, Underworld Ascendant. Um, that's another video that that uh, I did on this channel I've covered quite extensively and um, I wanted to play those games and those are about 20 hours each and I was like oh I could do all two for you know yeah if, if I hadn't have played we have a few I could have played uh, both of those and recorded gameplay and talked about those uh, which would have been have been more in keeping with what I want to do with this channel so yeah I was also just frustrated with how much time I wasted on the game part of that's on me because I could have stopped at any point but um, I just kept hoping it would get better with different perks, um, or what have you. So, yeah, We Happy Few's not a great game. I would not recommend it on a sale or anything, because, you know, even if you're mildly interested and you want to know, you know, just watch a couple of playthroughs online to get a feel for, you know, the characters and some of the jokes and some of the world. Don't watch the whole thing and don't, definitely don't play it. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say on We Happy Few. Um, yeah, I will be uploading the rest of my playthrough, though, if anyone wants to check it out. I played on Xbox One. Um, and yeah, I hope in the future to be uh, putting up much better content in, tem in terms of like reviewing much better content. So keep an eye out for any other reviews. Um, and play better immersive sims. Play a, a Bioshock or play System Shock 1 or 2. Um, or Thief. I recently reviewed Thief 2X, Shadows of the Metal Age. That is also a much better game. That's a great experience. It's a free mod, too. I think you do need Thief 2 installed to play it, but uh, every time it goes on Steam sale, it's like $2. So, um, I'm just trying to spread the word on that. If you have ever played any of the Thief games and you were a fan, you owe it to yourself to play this mod. It basically feels like it was made by the original developers but it was made by a bunch of fans for free it's a fantastic game i just finished it and it's a really great experience i also have a, a full playthrough of the game on my channel if you're curious um with that being said though uh that's all i have to say see you guys later